Our second reading for today comes from the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, verses 33 through 37. Listen for God's word. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So do you miss Job yet? We're clearly not in Job this week. You might have a little bit of narrative whiplash. I was uh, so excited to begin the worship service with our sort of informal sharing of joys and concerns that I neglected to mention at the outset that today is Christ the King or Reign of Christ Sunday, uh, pick, pick your title, uh, and Reign of Christ Sunday always gives us this juxtaposition of the text that, that Anne read, and were my children running around? Is that what people were, were giggling at? Um, the text that Anne read uh, from Revelation, the story of Christ's return and glory with, you know, like the white horse. I preached a sermon a couple years ago on Christ the King Sunday that I was looking back at where, where I talk about um, the thigh tattoo that it, that it says that Jesus has uh, in Revelation and, you know, the white horse and the warrior king, that, that kind of juxtaposition with Passion Week, with Good Friday, with Jesus on the cross, and the fact that we can't talk about Christ's exaltation, about Christ being lifted up without this image of Christ being lifted up on the cross. And that, that verse at the end there really crystallizes it. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And I think it's because we don't really fully grasp the cross. We need it to be re-injected into our worship lives and into our liturgical lives in November, kind of to jolt us awake. Because when it happens during Holy Week, it's so easy for us to skip over it. It's so easy for us to go straight to the exaltation of the resurrection and skip over the cross. And so the lectionary gives us the story of Christ's passion, the story of Christ's crucifixion as a direct juxtaposition with the grandeur of the opening hymn that we sang. Crown him with many crowns. My favorite verse is the the last part that says, uh, crown him the... uh, the Lord of Lords, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. That is a wonderful line. And you can't help but feel the disconnect and feel the irony with the image of Christ exalted on the cross, that Christ's kingdom is not from here. The other thing that 
is going on this week is it's finally stewardship week. You've seen the bulletin announcement for weeks and weeks that says, the stewardship season is upon us, and look for a letter that's going to come in the mail that is going to include a pledge card. Well, friends, the pledge cards are finally here. The letters are going to be mailed on Monday. There's some that are, that are scattered around the church. And if you read the letter, and I have to say it because, you know, pastors put so much time into their stewardship letters, and I know most of y'all don't read them. I know you think, oh, this is another organization that is asking for money. Oh, it's like saying, here, you throw this away for me. So I, this way you'll at least get to hear part of it because I have a captive audience. In my stewardship letter, I talk about how change is never easy for the church. And we are coming into uh, this time of the unknown because of the pandemic. And the pandemic created this, this crisis, this, this opportunity to change. Um, and, I, and I quote Bruce Reyes Chow, who is the former moderator of uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, who uh, describes that this is really a once in a generation's, once in your lifetime opportunity for the church to be transformed because the people have been forced out of the buildings, the people have been forced to adapt to new technologies, new ways of doing worship, and we can't just sort of go back to what has always been. The time to, to change is now. Um, and this is the way, I say, for the church to have a chance, to have any kind of chance to reverse our trend of declining relevance, resources, and participation. This is the chance to do that. And who doesn't want to reverse those trends for the church? Because we love the church. And as I was writing that letter on Christ the King Sunday, you know, we're way later than stewardship is supposed to be. Um, obviously, that's just sort of the year that we're, that we're in right now. It occurred to me, I don't know that I've ever heard a stewardship sermon preached on Christ the King Sunday. And I think what the beauty of this date does is it causes us to examine our faith as it's lived out in the example of Christ, as it's described in the gospel, and the institution of the church. I mean, think about it. I said this was our opportunity to reverse the institutional church's trend of declining relevance, resources, and participation. I really could have just said, this is our chance to reverse the mainline church, our church's trend of declining power and declining influence. Because that's what the church was in the good old days, right? In the 50s and, and 60s, when the pastor had a the local pastor had like a column that was reserved for him, because let's be honest, it normally was a him, uh, in the local newspaper. The pa what the pastor said, what the church did, everybody paid attention to. Church was where you were supposed to be on Sunday morning. The church had this great influence, huge membership. If you talk to churches that were began in the 50s or 60s, I really do feel like it is every, not every church, but so many churches that were started in the 50s and 60s, you get a tour of the church and you get a tour of the sanctuary 
And they say, well, actually, this wasn't originally supposed to be the sanctuary. This was originally our fellowship hall. And the sanctuary was planned to be built on the other side of campus because we just knew that we were going to outgrow this fellowship hall, that we were going to grow and grow forever and need a bigger sanctuary. But lo and behold, we didn't grow as we couldn't keep that growth up. We couldn't grow as fast as we wanted. And so this has become our de facto sanctuary. And so the question now is is the church's reduction in power? and an influence, a result in a reduction of faithfulness? That is a loaded question. Please, sometimes I would ask for audience participation. Please do not answer that question in your mind. Please do not shout it out loud. But again, is the church's Decline in power and influence and resources and participation, is that correlated to a decline in faithfulness? And I think on Christ the King Sunday, the power of the cross means not necessarily. The power of the cross reminds us that faithfulness and power are sometimes inversely related rather than directly related. It reminds me of that joke that I've told a couple times before about the two pastors who had been seminary classmates who are comparing notes after coming back uh, for a fifth reunion after graduating seminary. And the first pastor says, well, how are you doing? And he, the second pastor says, well, you know, I, I got out of seminary and I was called to this church where I am now. And when I got there, they had 100 members, but I implemented our growth strategies and, and our outreach strategies. And I started really hitting the recruiting and the fundraising. And, and now we have implemented these programs and we have grown to 250 members. And so then the, the other pastor says, well, that's great. I also arrived at the church where I am. We started out, we had about 100 members. I started preaching the gospel, and man, if I haven't preached them down to 10. <laughs> Sometimes faithfulness and power are inversely related. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes they are directly related. Sometimes you are able to see the fruits of faithful ministry in the form of increased membership and increased participation. But not always. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is totally alien to the kingdoms and the powers and the institutions of this world. Christ, throughout that crucifixion narrative in John's gospel, is being set up in opposition to the Roman Empire, to the emperor, to the kingdoms of the world. You might remember earlier in John's gospel, Jesus fed 5,000 people by multiplying five loaves and two fishes and Everybody loved it, and it said that the people were ready to make him king. But he slipped through their fingers, and he got away. They had not understood about what the nature of his kingdom was. They were used to the kingdoms of the world that say, Obey me, and I will feed you. Swear your allegiance to me, and I will protect you. I will give you safety and prosperity. Christ's kingdom, on the other hand, says, Obey me, and you might die. Follow me, and the way is to the cross. Obey me and lose your security. 
especially if you are someone that the larger cultural institutions of economy and politics and security has blessed with safety and prosperity. So I think on a Stewardship Sunday, on a Reign of Christ Sunday, the question isn't just how can we as the church regain some of our power and influence and resources and participation in 2022 and the year ahead, but how can we as the church regain some of our faithfulness and our obedience to Christ in 2022? The beauty of letting God be in charge is we legitimately don't know how that will turn out. It is up to God to decide if faithfulness means regaining power, regaining influence, higher membership, bigger budgets, more butts in the pews, as we like to say, or if being faithful means a willingness to sacrifice that for the sake of our call to love one another. Remember, that is the command that Jesus gives his disciples in John's gospel just five chapters earlier. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. That is both the means and the end in worldly kingdoms and in worldly institutions, the ends always justify the means. But in Christ's kingdom, in a kingdom of service and sacrifice and love, the means are the ends. How can we, as a church family, how as we, as households and individual families, be more courageous, be more faithful, be more like Christ, be willing to risk it all in the year ahead? He is king. Alleluia. Glory be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.